Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be on advanced features and workflow improvements, part two, uh, using Clip Studio Paint, and it will be presented by PJ Holden. Before we begin the webinar, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to share with you. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. The Q&A session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded and the recording will be available on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants as well as attendees. Today's panelists are Fahim Niaz, myself, Joanna Brower from Celsius, and the presenter, PJ Holden. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, Clip Studio Paint is your all-in-one solution for stunning, ready-to-publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. For more information, please check us out at clipstudio.net forward slash en, as well as at graphicsly.com. And with that, we'll be passing the reins of the webinar over to PJ, where he'll begin his demonstration. Hi, uh, my name is PJ Holden. I'm a comic artist best known for my work on Judge Dredd for 2008 AD and um, doing World of Tanks with Garth Ennis for Dark Horse. Uh, and I'm currently in the middle of drawing a very, very big graphic novel um, with, with Garth. Uh, so we've already done one webinar before um, with uh, Kelsis and Graphicsly that covered uh, some of what I, I kind of rather cheekily called advanced techniques and advanced skills and really uh, what they are is I think an awful lot of artists kind of they use Clip Studio as part of their workflow and when they get into that workflow they kind of don't explore the other options they don't kind of tend to look for easier ways to do things they, they find the the track that they want to go down and, and will often kind of stick to those tools that they use uh, without ever exploring beyond that because that takes time it takes time to find those things um, as it happens my background's in IT before uh, becoming a comic artist I worked for 20 years in in the uh, IT industry uh, I trained people I wrote software I did all sorts of things and because of that I, I tend to explore things I tend to when I've got software like clip studio I'll tend to go through it and start exploring things and that that's kind of led me to find the what I think are some of the faster ways to do some of the things. So some of the things that we we would do frequently as as a comic artist, um, I've kind of. I think I've discovered some of the faster ways of doing that. Every every tool in Clip Studio tends to have a multitude of, of options and lots of different ways of doing it. And so um, I kind of have been working on the basis of what's the best, what's which is the fastest ones of these that I can work with. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, generally my workflow. Um, I tend to go from a, uh, I do layouts usually on the computer and I, um, I'll do sort of a rough layout, uh, that little thumbnail drawing. I'll then uh, draw the pencils on, on paper, just traditional pencil and paper drawing. Uh, and what that does, that just allows me to freely draw without kind of thinking about computers and without thinking about, uh, I like I like the silence of paper, I like the noise that comes from the scratching of paper. So I, I tend to draw pencil like that. And I, I, won't even, I won't even mark out the page very accurately, I'll just get a rough notion of where the pages and where, where the um, uh, the document sizes and then I'll scan that paper in uh, that pencil page and that's when I'll start adding panel borders and so on within the computer uh, because adding panel borders in, in Clip Studio is so much faster than doing it by hand and I'll, I'll then print that out I'll print that out in a way that allows me to ink over that artwork and scan the art, art artwork ink uh, into the computer uh, and then I can tidy that up and so I'm going to talk about that process and how I do that um, it sounds time consuming and I think the reason it sounds time consuming is because there are multiple steps in there there's um, pencils scanned uh, digital bits print out scan uh, ink it scan uh, and then tidy up and so that sounds like there's a lot of steps in that but it's actually quite a fast process and it frequently is faster than doing everything on paper or doing everything digitally um, because what I'm really doing is I'm using the best tools for the job I think um, or at least the, the tools I'm most comfortable with so uh, penciling I find is just so much freer on on a sheet of paper uh, or can be um, 
and I can do that anywhere. I don't need to take my, I've got 27 inch Cintiq, which you're seeing right now. I don't need to take that anywhere with me. I can just use a, a notepad or something and just start scribbling out uh, ideas for a page and I can scan that into the computer and then start tidying it up and, and doing all the kind of more labor intensive stuff like panel borders within the computer. So I've got a document here. Um, it's a, a strip I, I, I co-wrote and drew called Terran Omega uh, with a friend of mine, Scott Ferguson, which is a, a kind of cool little sci-fi strip. Uh, you'll see here I'm actually using um, Clip Studio EX. So there are, I think, two versions of Clip Studio, Clip Studio Pro and Clip Studio EX. The primary difference between them is the EX allows you to have multi-page documents. Now, multi-page documents are incredibly handy because it allows you to have, as you can see here, I'll just shrink these down so you can see them, um, it allows me to have all of my documents in one in one location. I don't need to worry about folders. All of the documents associated with this uh, comic strip are in this one location. And it allows me to set up a single document size for one page. And then every time I add a brand new page, it just maintains the exact same document size. And that's, that's extremely handy. Uh, the other thing it allows me to do is it allows me to um, join two pages together to have a double page spread. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, right now, I'm, I'm just going to create a blank page here so we can actually uh, do some things with it. Um, I just add a nice little blank page there and we'll go in. And I'm going to describe, um, I think one of the things that people get confused about on um, Clip Studio is almost practically the first thing you have to do which is create a new document. Um, Clip Studio has a, a multitude of options here which can be a bit sort of baffling when you look at them. Um, I, it, 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 you're sort of overwhelmed by all of these things. It does have uh, certain default settings that you can use and um, it's actually much stronger on manga settings than, than it is on US or American comics, but it's got a whole bunch of sort of uh, paper sizes, but sometimes you'll want to create your own. And it's also handy to, to sort of understand what all of these things are. So I'm going to talk about those. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to go back to what would normally happen in traditional print. Um, traditional print, if you are working with a publisher, they will describe a document and they'll describe it as having um, a uh, what's called a, so you'll get the words, you'll hear the words trim, trim size, uh, bleed, and safe area. Okay, so to give you a sense of what that means, that basically means that um, the any comic page that gets printed has a safe area, and anything that appears in this safe area will definitely see print. It is the safe area, and then within that safe area, you'll have your text balloons and so on. You'll have any important things that you want to see. You'll basically have everything that is important to the comic is going to be in here. Uh, and safe areas, you know, your panel shapes would all typically be in there. If you can imagine, there's the, the borders of a printed page. That's a, that's a printed comic page. And there's little staples in there just to give you a sense of what that looks like. So that safe area looks like that. Now, outside of the safe area, you will have a trim and a bleed area. A bleed area is basically an area that is typically the, the widest boundaries of a page of artwork. So in other words, the, the safe area is if you're, or sorry, the, the bleed area is if you want some artwork to appear right on the edge of a page here. So, you know, for example, if you've got a, a galaxy or something and you want the sun to appear there, what you've got to do is draw right up to the, um, into the bleed. Okay, and the bleed, uh, as I say, typically goes beyond where the physical page would print. But the reason for that is that it's going to trip, it's going to cut that off. And so, if you don't draw a draw all the way to the edge, there's a chance you might get these funny little sort of lines where the where where the comic is trimmed. So what what you've got then is this area here is the bleed, and then you've got a trim area. And the trim area is generally a kind of there's usually a margin of of a little sort of margin where this trim area might be because the trim is where the, the process, where the physical process of the printing mechanism is used to cut the paper. So it will typically cut it, around, you know, it, it sometimes it'll cut it right uh, at one extreme of that bleed and sometimes it'll, or that, that trim and sometimes it'll cut it at the other extreme of the trim. So you need to have artwork that fills that gap there uh, to, in order to make sure that you you actually bleed off the page. So um, it's a little confusing, I think, because people use the expression to bleed off the page to mean to kind of have artwork that sort of goes off the page totally. Um, and then you've got uh, a tr uh, the bleed area, which is 
often a little bit of artwork that's lost that's cut off so you don't put anything important in there but you, you do still have to draw it because if you don't draw it and the artwork gets trimmed what can happen is that you can see where you've stopped drawing you can see those end bits and sometimes you can actually see that in printed comics so that that sort of explains the, the traditional printed process so just to go over that again you've got bleed and you've got trim and you've got safe now those those are the terms that are used in publishing comics in um, in the UK and in America. So your bleeds are sort of far far bit there. And let's go with uh, trim is this area that, that would be cut out um, within that. And then your safe area. I'll use a green just to show you what the safe area. The safe area is where your comic is absolutely going to be safe. And so a typical comic would be uh, let's see that down a bit. A typical comic might have a panel that goes. Uh, a nice full bleed panel here, you'll have a character here, uh, and you'll have another person there, and so on, blah, 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 and so on. Now, Clip Studio uses uh, the same, um, it uses slightly different words to describe exactly the same thing, but it also introduces another feature, and that other feature is the canvas. And the canvas is basically, um, Bleed, trim, and safe are all about the printed process and where the artwork's going to appear on the page. The canvas is about where your artwork is drawn. So the canvas actually extends uh, outside of the bleed and it gives you this kind of canvas area that isn't generally used by publishers, but it can be used by artists. So you can put extra information in there. You can put um, your story title and so on. All of that can be automated. Now, um, if you find this very confusing, and it, it can be very confusing, uh, sometimes it's best just to ignore the canvas and just use bleed, trim, and safe areas um, because that at least cuts it down in complexity. Uh, and I'll show you roughly how this maps up here on, on a, a brand new document. So you'll see this little, hopefully you can see this little sort of diagram here. Uh, and that sort of shows you what this thing will look like. Um, let's go for A4. So you'll see there, uh, there's the safe area is marked out here and then the bleed and the trim and then this wider area is the canvas and that tallies up to the word canvas here is this, this big page and then you've got manga draft, what they call manga draft settings here you've got uh, a binding size finish size which is this sort of inner inner bit oh, um, the inner bit which kind of roughly translates to where the the bleed would be and the trim and then you've got the safe area so this default border inner size is actually that safe area and then the binding finish size is this trim and bleed combined. So it, it uses a single size, but then it also a bleed width. In other words, if the size is 210, then in five millimeters within that is the bleed area. So that's just to give you some, it is kind of complex, hard to wrap your head around, but hopefully you can sort of understand what those numbers mean. Um, on the EX version of Clip Studio, you also have this option to add multiple pages. Uh, I'll quickly go through that because that has a couple of confusing options there. Um, multiple pages basically lets you set up a multi-page document. Um, you've got some extra features in here, uh, a binding point and a start page. The binding point and the start page describe where the staples are going to be on your paper. So if you imagine, if you actually, even if you lift up a comic uh, and open it up to that very first page of the comic, and you'll see the first page on a, a European or American comic, the first page is actually on the right hand side. Uh, the staples are on the left hand side of that first page. So uh, that basically maps to Binding point left binding. So for European comics, it's left binding and start pages from the right. For manga, uh, Japanese, uh, Chinese comics, and I'm sure others, um, your binding is the other way around. It's your, your, your binding is on the right hand side, your staples are, are, are on the right hand side, and the, the first page you read is on the left. But for UK comics, it's left binding from right. And that, and I'll, I'll create a very simple small document here just to let you see what that's going to look like. Um, if you're creating a multi-page document one of the other first things you've got to do is you've got to actually tell it which folder which directory you're going to create this in um, because it basically wants to keep a multi-page document is multiple single pages so it wants to know where you're going to keep all of these single pages because it's going to create them all for you so let's call this uh, uh, my comic um, and it'll just create that so it takes a couple of seconds to do this and there you go and you can see now I've got my first page you'll see the um, the simulation of a printed comic here so this center 
area here is where the binding happens and you'll see page one, two, three, four, five, six uh, and you'll see the uh, safe area and the uh, bleed which is the outer box and the trim area which is this inner box and then the canvas is the full size of that page and that's that's how that all maps out. Um, if you're exporting and your publisher doesn't want the canvas size, uh, you can basically say don't include the canvas size in the export, just give the page to these bleed points and it will be able to do that for you. Um, one of the great things about the, the multi-page documents, uh, Clips View will save your preferences every so often, so let's take a wee second there, is that I can combine pages, so if I want a double page spread, I can take one of these pages and then uh, you'll see there. there's only some of these pages will combine. I can't combine this this page and this page can't be combined and that's because physically they can't be there. You know, we've basically set this up to be exactly the same as a printed thing. Physically they can't combine. But this page two and three, page one and two can't combine but page two and three can. Page four and five can, page six and seven can and that, that's it. So if I want to join pages six and seven, I simply right hand click within the page view and select combine pages and what it'll do is it'll ask me a little question about what I want to do. Do I want to delete a layer with no drawings? Yes I do because it's it's merge it's essentially merging two pages together. Uh, do I want to line crop marks? Yes I do with zero gap and that will then merge these two. So now you've got and you'll see here um, even the the um, the crop marks have all changed slightly differently. You'll see that they've joined together. The page is not, uh, it's, it's got more canvas space left and right because it doesn't need all of this sort of dead space right in the middle. So your, your binding happens in the middle. And you and that's a, it's a superb way to kind of keep documents together. Uh, and then also the, the big benefit really is that you don't get confused over what size your document is. So I want to talk about that. But the other thing I want to talk about is layers. Now, if you've used Photoshop before, I'm sure you, you probably understand layers. Um, I think, uh, I think in the way back in the early days, layers were one of those really baffling complex things that uh, certainly I didn't quite understand. Um, but having used computers for years, I now I, I fully understand them. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about them very quickly um, because I want to talk about the specifics of Clip Studio Paint and, and what it can do with layers. So to explain very simply, uh, a layer, if you imagine it like a single sheet of, of uh, see-through paper, so any drawings can be on that single sheet. Uh, like that and that's great that's handy um, that's one layer you can have then a second layer on top of that um, and your second layer actually in fact we'll even do that we'll, we'll simulate that so that's layer one uh, I can create a second layer and I'm going to draw this second layer which is just sitting on top of that first layer and that second layer can contain I don't know let's let's give it a little bubble there and then whenever you combine those as a single drawn what you end up with is one thing sat on top of the other and it should look like something like that okay so that's that that's what they would look like combined um, layers I try and keep them layers to a minimum because I think it can very this this uh, layer area here can go very confusing very quickly so I tend to stick to uh, a pencil layer for pencils um, and a ink layer for inks, obviously. And if I'm doing colors, I'll have a what's called a flat layer, which is basically simple flat colors, and then a kind of render layer, which basically renders those colors. Um, and so I try and stick to, to that number of panels, or that number of uh, layers. Now, uh, layers can be grouped together. If you want to keep them nice and tidy, you can create a folder, and that folder can contain layers. Um, so there's my layers in, in one folder and I can then I can then sort of tidy those all up. So you can actually have uh, multiple pencil layers, you can have multiple ink layers, and if you keep them in folders it means that you can keep it all nice and tidy and nice and together. Now the reason that you use, use layers, first of all it is tidier, um, you can keep special effects on a certain layer, and if you make a mistake you can just delete those, that special effect layer without impacting anything else. Uh, but also there, there's sort of slightly magical qualities each layer can have. Um, I'll talk about the first of these, there's um, layer effects. Layer effects are things that happen on one layer. Uh, one of those layer effects, and possibly the most useful for, for uh, a comic artist, is layer color. And what you can do is when you press that layer color, it will change the color of the layer, all of the layer. So if I do that, you can see now that that layer there becomes a blue. 
and that's I, I can change the color of that I can change that to kind of lighter blue if I want there and that's brilliant for a pencil layer if you're doing pencils and you want the ink uh, a pencil artwork you can turn that off and on and it turns off and on very quickly there's no need to kind of there's no uh, it doesn't it's not actually converting it to blue uh, it's not converting it to any color so the uh, information in the computer is still exactly as it was it's just that it is showing you it as a blue color and I can demonstrate that if I simply um, so that's a color layer so I can actually add uh, I'll just add a little rainbow color in in there just to very quickly to show you what happens so that's now that's got plenty of color on it if I press the layer color you'll see those all those colors all now convert to sort of a blue tone um, I can turn that back off again and, it, and it's great so it's if you're taking a photograph into the computer to trace over you can bring a full color photograph in it press the layer color and suddenly it's a blue photograph you can just trace over very easily um, and that's great so some of the other effects that are there which I'll talk about very quickly tone tone converts a um, a layer into a series of dots like that so it'll take a, a color layer and turn it into black and white and it will actually give you these kind of bend day dots um, as you can see there it hasn't impacted on the line art very much because the line art's already black and white it's just slightly uh, kind of made it slightly bumpier but it's it's made a dramatic impact on this tone and that I mean the, the obvious benefit of that is if you're doing a black and white comic you can actually create a single layer that has all of these tones in it and anything you paint so if I take one of these uh, let's let's go with a smooth watercolor I can paint in watercolor if I turn that off you can see I'm sort of painting now I could paint around this face like this and then when I press the tone button you'll see it gains these little tones that are sort of lighter and darker and it's superb for, for if you're doing black and white comics this is this is a great feature and you can sort of change the uh, number of screen frequency screen frequency is basically how big or small those dots are so we can change those way down to make big nice big chunky dots like that uh, or way way up if we want very very fine dots um, I actually like C dots if I'm if I'm doing uh, a tone in a comic with dots like that I like the the frequency to be nice and low about 30 or so because then it's very visual and, and very obvious that they're there so you have a couple of other features you've also this this uh, extract line and that we'll turn that on that basically tries to convert whatever you've got into a line drawn um, it, so, some things it's brilliant at some things it's not so great at I think um, and you can play with settings there it's not a thing we're going to use very much uh, for what I'm talking about today but um, it's there so one of the other effects which I do like is the border effect border effect is a very simple feature all it does is it draws an outline around the layer anything on the layer that is solid color it will get an outline now I'm going to press it here and what it'll do is it'll draw a white outline so it won't look very different uh, because it's white on white but I'll do that now and then I'll pick a color to fill it with so we'll go with orange there and if I fill that with orange you'll see now that the the artwork has an orange outline around it I'll just increase the size of that now where that's useful is if you have say a layer that has got a little bit of artwork that that you know it's got a little dot of um, dirt on the screen on the on the um, artwork and you can't see it but you know it's there I know those dots are there but I can't see them I can turn that on I can instantly there they're very obvious where they are and I can just sort of erase those very quickly um, so that's that's useful on its own but the other area it's quite useful on is if you're doing visual effects if you're doing sound effects or something um, it's really I can take a pen tool and I can do kapow like that and you can see that that instantly is a really nice thing visual effect just using the outline um, and on top of artwork that, that that is very readable if I make that black you can see that looks even better there so you can see that's like a super fast way of doing a special effect um, all I've done is selected a white drawing pen and just drawn um, very simply on the layer now if I turn the the uh, outline off the edge color off again like that it will look like that artwork is going to disappear because I've drawn white on top of white but that's because the paper color is white um, the paper color is interesting every every new page in clip studio has a paper layer the paper layer is if you don't have the paper layer you'll get this which is uh, transparent so you'll see that the artwork is all black and white on a transparency uh, and the paper just sort of tidies up that transparency but you can actually change the paper color if, you, if you're drawing black and white comics and you find the screen a little harsh you can you can change the paper color like that 
and you'll see now that's that's sort of darkened everything down a little bit which is a little easier on the eye maybe um certainly for some if you have a big screen that that's a kind of more comfortable way to to look at that artwork and it can be very quickly turned back just to white again um so that that's a nice little feature so those are the effects. Now there are other features within a, a layer. A layer has other uh, attributes, as it were, uh, attributes that that um, are unique to layers and are useful for other things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those. So some of those attributes are accessible along along here, along this sort of layer bar. Um, you can lock a layer. That basically says I can't move anything or change anything on this layer. I can't draw on this layer. If I attempt to draw on it, you'll see there's a little cross thing saying nope. And that's great if you've got a layer that you want to keep. You know it's set in stone. You don't want to accidentally draw on it. Um, you can lock the uh, transparency of it. In other words, if I draw on this layer, I've locked the transparency. If I draw on this layer, let's draw with a red color, um, and attempt to draw on it, so I'm going to draw there. So that's part of the artwork that I've already drawn. And that's okay. But if I attempt to draw outside of that on the transparency, so I'll show you where the transparency again is. If I attempt to draw on the transparency, nothing will happen. It will not let me draw on that transparency. So I can actually just, I can do that. And that's great if, say, you want to recolor some artwork or do something slightly different with it. So, uh, I mean, a, a useful feature of that is to take a piece of line art and decide that you're going to color the line art. Uh, you're going to add red, you know, you're going to add red or blue or whatever it is that you're going to add to the line art. Uh, and you can do that by simply locking the transparency and then drawing over it. Um, so one of the other um, features of it is this this little icon that looks like a pencil. And that what that does is it tells Clip Studio that this layer is now a draft layer. And what that means is you might know it's a pencil layer personally you might realize well i know I, I know i've got some pencils in this comic and this is a pencil layer but clip studio doesn't really know that it doesn't it has no way of telling that what you're doing is a pencil layer or something else and by tapping that little icon it's telling clip studio that this is a pencil layer and uh, what that means is that you can use some of these tools in, in Clip Studio that will actually ignore pencil layers. So for example, you can have a fill, refer other layers here, which basically means if I fill on something, I'll check every single layer. So let's add a couple of, um, I'll add a couple of layers and we'll call them ink. Inks one, inks two. So, and then we'll call it, we'll just, give this the name pencils just so I don't get confused. Um, so on my pencil layer I'm going to draw like a shape. Oh, let's turn that outline off. I'm going to draw a little shape on the pencil layer. Uh, let's make that a little star shape. Okay. So that's that's a star I've drawn on the pencil layer. So you, you know if I if I set colors on the pencil layer you'll see that straight away. Uh, this ink layer I'm going to draw a box around it. Okay. So now again that's the pencil layer, the box is drawn on the ink layer. Now, if I go to fill, my fill to tool here, and refer only to editing layers, uh, well, actually, what, what we'll do is, I'll add another layer here, we'll add a second, we've, we've got a second ink layer, and what I'll do is I'll draw another shape only on this layer, so this is only on, on this layer right there. So if I, I can color that as well, let's give that um, a red color just to indicate that it's an ink. So that's two ink layers I've got now. Uh, and I've got a pencil layer. If I go to fill and use refer only to editing layer, that means if I press the fill on this layer, anywhere on here, if I, I tried to fill within this little corner here, say I want to very specifically fill this corner uh, and try and fill it here, using the refer only to editing layer, it will ignore the layer below and it will only fill within the, um, the layer that I've got here, the red layer. So let's undo that. It's acting as if these other layers don't exist, basically. Um, now, that is uh, great, but sometimes what you want to do is you actually want to fill, uh, you want to make sure you know about these other layers. So I can do this option that says refer to other layers. And what that does is when I go to fill here, it will actually see that there's a boundary there and there, and it'll fill in only to that boundary. So you can see that's that's worked quite well. Now, one of the things it does uh, that's really smart is it will actually ignore a pencil layer. So if I'm, I'm going to stop this being a pencil layer for a second and show you what happens when I fill here. So if I fill here, you'll see it fills up to that triangle or that, that star. If I turn that layer back to draft layer and go back to fill that in, it actually will ignore 
that that layer all together and fill in and you can tell I mean if you were if you were dealing with pencils and you were inking digitally on the computer you can instantly tell that's a very useful feature um, that basically means that you can have your pencil layer and you can be inking over it and it will ignore what's on the pencil layer um, so another thing that you can do is I, I said uh, previously that we can have a folder the folder itself can have a, uh, an indicator, it can be set as a draft layer and what that means is that anything within that folder automatically becomes a draft layer. It sort of inherits the fact that the folder is a draft layer. So where that's useful is that um, you might have multiple layers that are pencils that you might want to actually keep in that one folder. It means you don't have to tell them they're all draft folders. You can just, any layer I create there becomes another uh, draft layer. If I drag it out of there, it's no longer a draft layer. So it, it's a good way of kind of, if say I take a bit of, a bit of artwork that I'm not very happy with, it, I've, I've drawn a face or something here and I've already inked it, but I'm thinking, I would like this to look better. What I can do is I can drag that down to the pencil folder that I've created, that draft folder, and that becomes now a draft layer and I can just ink over that. The other thing that, that uh, each of these inherits the properties of the folder. So if I set the folder to have a layer color of a, of a light blue like this, you'll see those layers all now are that light blue. If I drag the, the layer out, you'll see that that becomes black again. I drag it back in that becomes blue and now I can ink over that so and again because I um, because it's set as a draft layer if I were to fill this in it would fill in and ignore basically what's there um, if I if that wasn't a draft layer let's drag that out just to reconfirm so that's not a draft layer although I will set it blue if I tried to fill in you'll see it it goes to the where that blue is because the blue is it's basically using the blue as a way to say oh no there's a line there um it's using that layer and going nope there's a line on that but because the layer is in that folder it ignores the layer altogether so i can just i can just keep drawing like that uh, and that's kind of it's how i work i mean i, I essentially I, i'll scan in artwork and i'll keep it in a draft folder like that uh so that the the software knows that it's a draft layer the other thing that this is useful for is that um it's not just the drawing tools the drawing tools and the selection tools all of these tools and their sub tools can all kind of ignore the draft folder or they are the draft layers or they can be set to kind of do something with the draft layers but you can also do things like if you're going to export um a file from this you can say let's export that and you can say I want to exclude the pencils I want to exclude the draft layers and you'll get we'll get a little preview here and you'll see that's excluded all of those other layers because they were all draft layers and that's great if you're working with collaborators uh, and you're working with other artists and you want to send them what the inks of the artwork looks like without sending them the pencils you can do that if you want to send them the pencils you can do the same thing I can again exactly the same way I can go into the export oh. go into the export and tell it I want to include the draft click OK and now you can see the draft is, is included and again this this works with pencils uh, it works with uh, exporting but it also works with printing you can specify to include or exclude the draft when you're going to print um, so that you can always kind of have full control over what it is you're doing so to go back now, now we've kind of explored all of that I want to put that together with how it all works how I work um, so I'm gonna go this is the um, the comic Terran Omega that I, I, I started with um, I'm gonna go into this image here now this is this is a pencil scan but I'm gonna show you how you get to there uh, what I do is I'll, I'll usually use file import um, scan now I have a, a lovely big a3 scanner so I can scan in a full page at one time but you can you know if you have a, a smaller scanner you can scan them in and, and splice them together I did that for years and years and years so I know the pain of trying to cut that artwork together uh, I'm not going to show you the interface for the scanner because it's it's going to be different than everyone's scanner but once once artwork scanned into the computer it looks like this um, this is a, a grayscale scan a true grayscale um, most scanners will have three options they'll have grayscale black and white or color um, sometimes they'll have more one of them might be sort of a, a dither or some something like that but th they boil down to grayscale black and white and color uh, grayscale means bring it in with all the grays and that's great for pencils uh, black and white means bring in black and white artwork and that you know that's great for uh, 
optical character recognition. It's great for text, but it's also great for line art, comic book line art. It's not great if you're a, uh, if you're an artist who's using grey wash in your artwork, in which case you've generally got to bring it in as grayscale. And it's not great if you're a painter and you want to bring a paint, and then you've got to import, you've got to scan it in as full color. But once it's bought in. Uh, Clip Studio brings artwork in uh, from the scanner and from image import in this uh, as an image type. It, it's basically slightly different than a proper layer um, and, and there's a couple of steps you need to go through to convert it to something that you can deal with and you can edit. Uh, and what I'm going to show you, and we, we covered this a, a lot in the first webinar we did, which was the creation of auto actions. Auto actions are a way to record a bunch of steps so that you can replay those actions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do exactly the same thing again. I'm going to um, create an auto action for the steps that I take when I've scanned in some pencils just to show you how easy this is. Uh, so I'm going to go to window auto action. That shows me my auto actions I've already got. So I'm going to drag this over here so you can see these slightly more clear. I'm going to create a brand new auto action. You can, if you want to keep things tidy, you can have your own set of auto actions. You can actually, uh, you can download auto actions from other people. Um, I'm going to create a, just a new auto action here. So, and we'll call this uh, clean up pencils, pencil scans. Okay, so that's the name of it. Now it's not going to record anything until I press this record button and when it records what it'll do is it'll record each step, each step by step thing I do. So if I do a thing and undo, what it records is it records the thing and it records that I've on I've done an undo, but it records both those steps. So if you actually if you do too many things and you undo and so on, you can go in and tidy it up afterwards um, so that you don't sort of step through 20 things when you only meant to do three. So I'm going to start record. And I'll talk through the, the things that, that uh, I need to do on this. So there's a couple of things. First of all, you'll see this is not this does not look like grayscale. What this is right now is dithered because it comes in with screen tone set on. If you scan in an image or import a file image, it comes in with screen tone set on. But it's I mean we just turn that off. That's as simple as that. Um, and and now we've got the artwork. Now this isn't too bad, but often the artwork I will scan in will be a little too light. Um, because I pencil, I used to pencil with a 2H pencil and it's quite light. So the next step is to really kind of darken this down. And I, the process I do for this, there's lots of different ways of doing this. Um, but actually one step before that is because it's still an image and it's not a proper um, layer within Clip, Clip Studio, uh, it's, a, it's an image and you can tell by that little picture icon it's got. The, f the next thing I've got to really do is rasterize the image and all that does is it converts it to a layer that, that you can then do stuff with. So I'm going to rasterize that. That takes a, a little second. And again, you'll see over here at Auto Actions, it's saved that step. So then essentially I'm doing these th these bunch of steps and the next time I scan in a, pe a pencil uh, drawing, I can just run this Auto Action and it'll do all these steps for me. So the next thing I want to do is just is darken it down a little bit so I can go to uh, Tonal Correction. And there's lots of options here. You can use brightness and contrast to do it. Um, you can use posterization to do it by playing with it a little bit. You can use level correction to change the levels of the, the colors within it. Um, all of these all of these will work. Um, the, the method I tend to go for is tone curve. And it's because it, it gives you this sort of representation of what uh, colors there are here. Um, I just grab this little thing and get a simple curve like that and you see straight away that's made a big difference that's as dark as an ink bit of artwork now and I can just okay now it's not an ink bit of artwork it is just grayscale um, so there's a couple of other steps I also will rename it I tend to name it pencils um, I will set it as a draft layer so uh, Clip Studio knows this is a pencil layer um, because even though I've called it pencils it it doesn't realize I intend for this to be a pencil layer. The other thing I'll do is I'll change the layer color. So I'll go in, so the layer color by default is this kind of blue. And I actually want um, what uh, comic artists have used for decades, this color that's referred to as non-repro blue. It's basically a very light cyan. And what happens is anything scanned into a computer as black and white, or if it's processed through a photocopier, if you uh, use this very light kind of cyan color, that, that cyan color disappears, it, it vanishes, the printer ignores it, which is why it's called non-repro, as in no reproduction, it does not reproduce. It's called blue, but it's kind of a cyan color. Um, so I set that to this, which is like that. And then I actually turn it off um, because I still want to see the pencils. But what it's done is it's changed the, uh, anytime I press that button, it will be that blue now. So I'll stop that. 
I'll stop my auto action because those are the steps. Those are a perfect amount of steps I want. Now there's a couple of little tricks in here. One is that I can go in and delete any of these these little steps by just dragging them down to the bin. The other thing is some of these steps have uh, so the, the tick box here. This first tick box says. Uh, yes, do this in the in these steps. Yes, do this. Uh, I can say no. Let's not do that. Let's not. Let's ignore this step. Let's not set that to a draft layer. So it'll basically step through all of these and not set that. Um, now sometimes some of these things actually rely on the previous thing being done. So uh, generally, if you've done it all, all, you'll often want to keep all of those. But some of these steps tone curve. So the next time I run this, it will not ask. It'll not show me that little. Um, it'll not show me this. I'll show you it again so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, it won't show me this tone curve uh, dialog box. It won't show me that. What it'll do is it'll just use the settings I used the last time because that's what it's going to save. And change layer name. It won't ask me what the layer name is. It will just change it to what I changed it to before. Now, these have a little extra box beside them. Some of these options have this little extra box. And what this extra box means is I want to see the, di I want to see the dialog box for this. In other words, even though uh, the last time I called it pencils, the next time you run I want you to stop and ask me what you want to call this layer. And that can be useful if you're uh, dealing with different kinds of, if you're dealing with multiple pencil scans, maybe you've got three or four pages that, that uh, have, have to be assembled in the computer together. So you can have one called pencils one, one called pencils two, and one called, you know, uh, section that I missed out on. Uh, and you can just turn that uh, dialogue box off and on. So if you turn that dialogue box on like this, it'll ask you every time. If you turn it off, it won't ask you anymore. So that's, that's what I do with pencils. Now, the next stage for me is to create a, for a frame folder. Frame folders are that area that um, put away my auto actions. Uh, frame folders are the way that you draw panel borders in Clip Studio. Frame folders are great for that. They are super fast for that. Um, what I'll do first of all is um, because this this setup of Clip Studio is a, is a completely blank setup. Um, I set it up clean, so uh, you, you should be seeing. Everyone should have seen this uh, Clip Studio looking a bit like this at some stage. Um, but what I'm going to do is a couple of things in preference, which I like to set on any new installation, which I think are very, very useful for everyone. Uh, again, I covered some of these in, in the first uh, webinar that we did. Uh, so the very first thing I always change is the ruler unit measurements. The unit of length is always set to pixel by default on a new install. I always change that to millimeter, always change it to millimeter. And, and the reason for that is that the pen measurements are all done within unit of length measurements. So when you look at a pen that says five, if the unit of length measurements is in pixels, it's five pixels. Uh, if you look at it uh, and it says five and the unit of length measurements in millimeters, it means five millimeters. And that means that it's resolution independent. It means that if you do a, a page that's 300 dots per inch or a page that's 900 dots per inch or a page that's 72 dots per inch and you use unit of length in millimeters, then you will have exactly the same size of pen. It's just changing the amount of millimeters. It's doing these little calculations for you behind the scenes that you don't see and don't need to worry about. Um, if you leave the unit of length on pixels, it will not do that for you. So so I, I've, I've met people who have kind of, for years, never quite understood why their pen sizes were not the same as millimeters. And it's because of this section in preferences. Um, so I set that. So the next thing I do as well is, um, I'm gonna click OK, so that, that sets that. The next thing I, I often change is frames have a couple of default settings. Um, the frames will have a gutter and that gutter is set here for all of them. Um, the vertical gutter and horizontal gutter. I like a five millimeter gutter. Um, again, if, if we had um, unit of measurements in pixels, I would have had to specify that by pixels. And I, I mean, I can't wrap my head around what size a pixel is in, in the computer. So uh, it's it's much easier to set it to millimeters because you know then if I print that out, it will be five millimeters. Uh, you know, if, I, if it's 600 pixels, I don't know if I'm gonna get five millimeters or 10 millimeters or some other figure. Um, so I set that to millimeters there, or five millimeters. Um, and that's a good kind of setting, um, a good default setting. Uh, let me create a uh, layer, new layer and we have a frame border folder. So the frame border folder has a couple of um, things to it. There's a couple of sort of settings. Part of it is the line width. The line width is how thick the border is that's drawn on the page. So I'm gonna set that to 1.4. 
and there we go and you can see this we've created this frame border and it's a nice thick chunky border um, it surrounds the all of the artwork by default it goes to the entirety of the safe area of the artwork um, and we might want to uh, change that so what we're going to do is um, what we'll do is I, I'll now splice this up into into the different panels so I'll use the divide frame border frame borders can be divided by frame folders and borders so a slight diversion is I'm going to talk about what that means so I'm going to go into I'll just go into a nice blank page here just to explain that uh, there we go so there are three parts to a frame folder uh, frame folder one is the border the border is the black lines that you see so those are lines that are drawn sort of magically by um, by the software, wherever your panel borders are. And you can actually have, um, you saw there are thick panel borders, but you can have a single page might have all sorts of different panel borders within it that you can sort of specify. Um, you're not limited to just having purely straight. You can actually have overlapping ones, you can have circular shaped ones, all sorts of things. Um, but the second thing that a frame folder is, is um, an actual folder so similar to how the other ones were how I showed you the folders earlier on it contains um, you can put your 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 images within a folder and the third thing that it has is it has a mask and the mask basically is this area of the artwork that you will want to hide and that very sensibly is I mean you don't necessarily want to see the artwork between the gutters for example that would all be masked out uh, and so on so if we go back to the artwork you'll see this in a second but so so you've essentially got borders uh, a folder which contains each of each layers so the layers right um, and then a mask and the mask and the the border are kind of joined at the hip basically wherever you draw a border it creates masks around that that uh, frame border uh, the folder there's two options here. One is to kind of just keep one nice simple folder for all of your artwork and all of the borders. So when you split it all up, you get one single folder. The other option you can do is actually every time you split up a panel is to, is to create a brand new folder. So every time I, I split a panel in half and just draw a magic line down the middle, I could end up with uh, frame folder one and uh, frame folder two. And that would be one and that would be two. And they are basically, identical to each other except this one has a mask that surrounds it and this one has a mask that surrounds it so um, that means you can keep your artwork all tidied up and all together in each of those folders now for me personally that means you end up with hundreds and hundreds of folders and, and I don't always want to do that so I try and kind of minimize the amount of folders I've got so let, let's go back in here and I'll show you how that how that actually translates so if I, first of all, if I take the pencil layer and drag it into the frame folder, you see the purpley blue color here is a mask. If I take this pencils in, right now the pencil folder and the frame folder are sort of, they're on top of each other, but the pencil folder is not inside the frame folder. But if I drag it inside, you'll see that the mask suddenly applies and that the artwork outside of, uh, which we saw a second ago, so I'll drag it back out to show you, that artwork that's outside, that's outside in this blue area, will get cut off and that could be great that could be exactly what you want um, it's not how I like to work I like to work that I can sort of see all of my artwork but that's you know that's how some people will work so we'll take this um, the by default the space of frame border uh, is set to what the preference settings were but it, it it's it doesn't actually take them from the preference unless you tick that box there so I can now do that and if I so if I just use that tool you'll see it can it comes up with a, a border there if I hold the shift key it'll lock it into position so I can just lock it into horizontal and vertical position so let's do that and you'll see what's happening there is it's you can see a little icon representing where the mask is and I can very quickly just split that across like that and you'll see that's that's very nice and neat and tidy I've got one folder which has got my uh, panel in it and I've got a pencil layer within that uh, and this has got my frame borders and so on. I can play around with these and resize them and so on uh, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six panels and that's great. Now the alternative way of using the, the frame folder is to actually divide them by the frame folder so the same thing and what you'll see happening is now there is two frame folders and the second one has a they, they they have individual masks and i can do that and i do that and that and that and now i've got 
one frame folder for every single uh, image and it's for me it's a little hard to manage it it's it's just quite a lot going on um if you're the kind of artist that likes to work on individual images it's probably great because it means i can just concentrate on this single panel um without worrying then moving on to the next one and the next one and the next one but for me personally uh that just sort of it, it compounds the chances of me getting things wrong. It means there's a good chance that I might accidentally draw on the wrong layer and, and do all sorts of things. So I just like to kind of do it this way. Um, so we'll just split that up again. Now the reason I do all of this, because the next step in my process is to, well, what I'll do is actually, I can use the uh, object subtool. Object subtool is, is a way of sort of editing sort of meta objects, things that aren't drawings, things that aren't layers really, but, but are other things, so 3D objects and panel borders and other things, other tools. So I can then go in and just grab these little handles and shrink and enlarge them. And you'll see as I, as I shrink and enlarge this one, it's bringing these other ones up, which can be useful, but isn't what I want to do. And the reason it's doing that is because there's a little option ticked here, which is work with another frame folder and when that option is ticked it it tries to be clever and it sort of moves the other panel borders you can see I'm, I can move everything here which is great um, but it's not what I'm after um, let's undo we'll go step back so what I'll do is work with another uh, so if I drag that up just to show you again so it drags up it drags up the second panel if I bring it back down so if I turn that off I can then just drag that up and you'll see that it doesn't do that anymore now it's just it's working with a single a single panel uh, and then what I'll do is I'll take my um, pencil layer I'll hit my colorize and you'll see it'll go to that non repro blue color that uh, I was talking about earlier and that now for me is ready to print uh, what happens is I will print this out I'll print this out exactly as you see it so that I've got a black border and uh, blue uh, pencils and the reason for that is it means I don't have to pencil the, the board panel borders when I what I get then is a piece of paper that has the pencils on it in blue which means I don't need to rub anything out and it's got the panel borders in black which means I don't have to draw the panel borders and I, on, I mean, it, I imagine it's it's hard to imagine that this is quicker, but it means I don't have to like I literally don't have to spend any time at all rubbing anything out. I don't I don't erase my pencils. Um, I'm a, a little cheap, so what I'll do is I'll flip the pencil page over and print on the reverse side of it in my printer, and that means that the artwork is all on one single page, uh, one physical page. Uh, I don't have to spend any time at all. You saw how fast it was to create those panel borders. To do those by hand is uh, actually for me quite difficult because I've got. A, I like to measure out the, the panel borders to get exactly five millimeters. So I've got to physically measure out where all the panel borders are. Uh, I've got to remember where those measurements are for whenever I'm going back into the add the corresponding opposite point. Then I've got to pencil the panel border shapes where they're going to go. And then I've got to get my ink pen out, and which often will need clean because it's a repeater graph and, and I might not use it. I might use it every three days. And so by the time the third day comes around, it's very clogged up and I've got to clean it up. So that can take an hour, you know, that can take 20 minutes to clean up one of those and then you've got to refill it with ink if you if you've run out of ink and then and then you draw and then you realize it's not that sharp and you've got to tip x out and things so it's actually like it's loads faster just doing even if even if you only use clip studio to do this one thing this is like this will shave uh, hours off your working week hours um and and actually days and days and days off your working life uh, and uh, you know a working year it'll shave days off it no no problem whatsoever um so i'll print that out uh, I'll go to file print uh, print settings. Uh, I'll make sure that draft is switched on because don't forget that pencil layer. There is a draft layer, and if I if I don't uh, tick that box, what it'll do is it'll print the panel borders but not the pencils. So I've got to tick both. And then depend on your printer. Some printers uh, you'll need to change the settings within the printer to say I want this in color. The other thing that you might need to do is. Uh, print size same as detail scale up or down or pixel size and so on S scale up and down basically means shrink this if i'm printing if i've drawn an a3 page and i'm printing on a4 paper shrink it down if i've drawn an a4 page and i'm printing on a3 paper psh, enlarge it uh, i like to uh, one of the things i do is is the paper that i draw on the physical paper that i draw on i use exactly the same measurements on the digital drawings which is one of the reasons I don't use pixel units uh, and what that means is that my paper is actually one-to-one -one. I can just print that out and it's exactly the same size it was when I I penciled it um, and so I, I'll print that out and what I get, do then is just traditionally ink it uh, as you'd expect uh, so once I've done that though I'll scan that ink in 
Um, I'm looking for my ink scan page. Here we go. I think this is it. Um, scanning the ink page. Again, it comes in exactly the same way as the, the previous um, pencil pages would do. This is scanned as pure black and white. Uh, there's a couple of differences. Um, very frequently, most scanners will have these little smuts of dirt in them. Um, I've actually, I've enhanced the dirt in this so there's slightly more than you might normally have, but uh, generally my, my scanner will have little bits of where you've erased some artwork. You might actually, uh, if, if you've used Tipex at all in the paper, you'll sometimes get little black marks. Uh, the print or the scanner itself will often catch little bits of dried ink on it uh, and so you will tend to get these little uh, bits of dots and so on. I'm hoping you can, I'm going to zoom right in so you can see what I'm talking about. So you can see these little tiny, that's a 200% zoom, you can see how small these little things are. Um, so once it's scanned in it comes in again as an image file and again I'm going to use do the same thing I did there a second ago, I'm going to uh, create a, an action for this because it'll save me having to do it again. So I'm going to call this action um, clean up ink scan and then I'll start recording. So the first thing I do with this is I've got to, I don't need to uh, play around with tone or anything, it's coming as a pure black and white uh, line art, that's great. Um, so all I really need to do is rasterize this first of all. Okay, so that rasterizes it. Now it's on the computer here's a grayscale, I don't want a grayscale, I want a pure black and white pure monochrome, so I set that to monochrome. I'm going to change the name of it to inks. Uh, and then the next step here is <coughs> expression color. Now, Clip Studio is unusual in that uh, a monochrome layer actually has uh, three types of marks that can be made on it. It can have a black mark, as you can see here. It can have a white mark, which is sort of what you're looking at here. And it can also have transparency. Now you can get a bit uh, confused about transparency and white because the paper is white. So if I just hide the paper for the moment, um, or actually even better, I'll, I'll make I'll make the paper uh, a kind of light color and hide the artwork. So you'll see my paper's uh, pinky color, salmon pink. If I show the artwork again, you'll see um, that the artwork has got white on it. And the way to actually prove that is if I use the eraser and just rub that out, you'll see underneath the artwork there, that's that's the, the paper. So what I like to do though is, is I like my artwork to just be black because it means then that if I'm going to color, I can color underneath it and the black artwork doesn't get interfered with. So what I do is the expression color has a little change expression color buttons here. I press the black so all we see is black and then I can do apply expression color of preview, which basically this is just me looking at it right now. I can turn it back again, but if I just do that and then apply expression color, you'll see it'll take a wee second and there we go. And now what we've got is a pure black line art. Um, I can create layers underneath that and I can uh, add color and so on. Um, so I've, I've created lots of extra things in my action here, which we'll delete, but that's okay. Uh, so the next step is actually cleaning up all these dirty marks. Now Clip Studio has a couple of brilliant tools for this. Um, and they sort of depend, they, again, like many of Clip Studio's tools, there's lots of ways of exploring these, but uh, the quickest way to use them is to go to filter, correct drawing line, and you've got an option that says remove dust. And you'll see lots of little options here. Um, I'm gonna turn off preview. Um, so you can see, uh, what we what we can do here. So preview's turned off and you'll see all the dust there. So if I turn preview on, you'll see what it does is it tidies up quite a lot of that dust. It'd be better just to zoom in a bit so you can see it a bit better. So there's the dust there and it's saying size of dust are anything less than 0.11. Um, so we preview that and you'll see most of it disappears. Now I, I can go a bit braver. I can go slightly bigger than that and you'll see most of it disappears. Uh, one danger of that is that sometimes you'll find small marks that you want to keep will also disappear. So if, if uh, a character has a couple of uh, dots for eyes, sometimes they'll vanish. So what I tend to do is, is err on the side of caution with this filter and go for a smaller size and just click OK. And you'll see that this page now has been nicely tidied up. There's none of those little, there's sometimes you'll get a little bit of dot there. And the, the way to fix that, I'll just stop our auto action because we've recorded everything we need now. The way to fix that is that you can now manually go in and clean up those images. You can either erase them, which is one way of doing it, or you can use in the, uh, one of the tools is correct line, but beside it is a remove dust tool. And the remove dust tool is exactly the same as the uh, filter remove dust, except you can draw a square around whatever it is that you're trying to you're trying to delete and you can also set it much much bigger um, and if you set it much much bigger so for example that's too big but that's okay because I can be quite selective where I'm going to use this so I can use it here and go well there's bits of 
dirt there. That, I've got rid of that. Uh, and so that's 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 how I tidy up my black inks. Um, and with that, I think that's covered everything that we did on the webinar. I think there was a couple of questions that we didn't quite get to um, on uh, things like inspiration and so on, um, which I'll answer in, in I'll answer any YouTube questions on, on and just reply to the YouTube questions if there are any questions. Um, I hope you got something out of that. Um, there, I'm very quickly. I, I think I covered lettering, um, so I'll quickly cover lettering. Um, the lettering features in Clip Studio. Uh, the lettering tool has by default a single lettering uh, sub tool, um, which is okay. It's by default on my computer set as to whom it might well be exactly the same on yours. It has a bunch of options there. What we can do with this is we can uh, give it a font that is more appropriate. First of all, so we'll just select a font. I have a, a, a comic letter and font on here called Comic Crazy. Um, I think you can buy uh, fonts from all sorts of places, but the uh, Kelsus and, and Graphically, I think, have, have font options for you. Um, what I can do here is if I, if I create a text drawing tool here with Comic Crazy, nine point, and I'll say, hello world. There we go. That's my, that's my uh, dialogue there. If I uh, grab one of these little bars, which you do with the object manipulator here, you can move it around and you can shrink it and enlarge it. Uh, what that does is it will um, enlarge the text, which is great for sound effects, but it's not great for dialogue. Dialogue, you basically want to stay at nine point all the time. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to edit some of the features of this uh, text. So let's go back down to our text here. Um, this, now this is this is very applicable. Every subtool has has an editing feature like this. So what I'm going to show you within the text subtool can more or less be replicated within all the other subtools. So it's useful to sort of even if you're not going to letter in the software, it's useful to see where these things lie. Uh, so you've got a couple of buttons here. What well, first thing I'm going to do is uh, the this has uh, there are two buttons down below the subtool properties. One of them is edit uh, edit all basically means let's look at every feature in this and let's edit every feature the other button is basically reset this to where it would default to so if I press reset comic crazy will change back to to Homa. so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create uh, comic crazy here again as my font of choice comic crazy where are we there we go uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this this um, text subtool. I'm going to call it balloon uh, lettering. Okay. Now, I can reset that back to default and that goes back to Tahoma. My balloon lettering now is actually, the default on balloon lettering is whatever the settings were on the previous tool that I copied it from. So Comic Crazy is now the default style of uh, uh, font for this, this style. But I want to change a couple of other things within the text. One of those things is the, um, let's see, this option here, wrap text at frame. Now what wrap text at frame means is this little uh, frame that's around the text, you can see here if I enlarge it, enlarges the text, which is great for sound effects, not great for dialogue. If I set wrap text at frame to on like that, and what I'll do is beside that, you have a couple of options. One is this little thing that gives you sort of extra options. One of them is this little visual thing. If I turn that off and on, you'll see on the property tools, it shows that setting within property tools. You can you can do that with all of these. All of these can be set to show in the property tool settings, but we're going to do that with this one. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to register all settings to initial settings. In other words, if I reset this, uh, wrap text at frame would turn off, but if I register this as the new default for this, wrap text would be turned on. Uh, if I if I uh, reset factory setting, wrap text would be turned on. Wrap text. If I now take this tool, um, so that's still using the old settings. But if I take if I we do another one, a brand new one. Uh, hello, this is a dialogue test. So if I now take this, you'll see it's wrapping that text around as I as I move it there. So there's still things I I don't quite like about that. One thing I want to do is set it to uh, be centered aligned. Um, so we go in there, set alignment, and again I'll just register that to my default, and that now gives me a nice. Anytime I want new dialogue, I can basically let's get rid of that. Oh. Uh, uh, delete with layer. 
delete this layer. There we go. So let's go back there. And if I do uh, uh, quickly, we need to save the world. Uh, you've So you'll see that there's too much text there, the frame's too small, but I can just enlarge that frame by grabbing it and bringing it down. And you'll see it centers the text within that frame as well. And that's that's kind of how uh, comic book lettering, lettering is normally done. Um, I can then add a balloon around that. I can just go down here to a balloon. Uh, the best, I mean, you can use an ellipse balloon, an ellipse balloon sort of will always give you a perfect ellipse, but it can be a little robotic looking. Um, we do a perfect ellipse around that it's you know it's it's okay but once you have a lot of ellipses around the page it can feel a little kind of staid um, so a slightly nicer way of doing that is to use the curve balloon and instead of trying to build a very dramatic looking curve what your best bet is to the curve balloon lets you drop little anchor points so if I drop a little anchor point that that sort of ignoring the curve that it's making and just imagine a square around it and draw a little square and you'll see you've got got something that's visually slightly more interesting looking and we can move that so if I use the object tool I can move the text uh, Clip Studio is actually quite smart so if I move the text over here I can move the text anywhere I want if I grab the balloon it'll actually grab the balloon and the text uh, which means it's, it just makes it so much easier to move things around if I want to with again with the object tool I can grab these little bits that I drew for the curve and I can grab them so that they can be shaped a little better and then I can add a um, dialogue teal, like so. And there we go. We've got a little bit of dialogue. I don't really have time to go through a lot of the uh, lettering tools. You can, again, as with the, the, the text there, we can create a, a, um, different kinds of balloon tails. This is a very simple straight one. It's actually quite good for doing this kind of visual effect as well. Um, but you can also, you can have a... a a, a, a polyline which is a kind of a selection of straight lines or a spleen which is a curved line so we can do this kind of thing like that uh, and if you want you can actually again I can duplicate that and call it curved tail and now this curved tail will always be this kind of tail so the way that works is just every single tap Every time you tap once, it gives you a point on a curve, and every, when you when you want to finish, you just double tap, and it'll finish. Uh, and I can go back to my balloon tail, and if I just reset the settings on the balloon tail, so now I've got a nice straight line balloon tail like that, and I've got a curved balloon tail tool as well. Um, and as I say, every Clip Studio Paint has a similar setup. Basically, every sub tool works in the same sort of way. You can go in and change the settings. In fact, I could even go into this and hide I don't necessarily, because this is always going to be a curved tail, I can hide that setting. Um, I can even hide that. So now I, I don't have any settings, which means I don't need to uh, worry about that. I know exactly what I'm always going to get with this. It's always going to look like this. Uh, and I never have to worry about the settings. So yes, that's me. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you got something useful out of it. Uh, excuse any ums and ahs and any coughing that I might have done on the thing. I just want to thank uh, Fahim and Joanna um, from Graphicsly and Kelsis for having me, asking me to come back and do another one. Um, sorry for any technical hip hiccups um, that may have occurred. I hope you got something out of this. Uh, that's me, I'm PJ Holden, and you can find me on Twitter at Paul J. Holden or on my blog at www.pauljholden.com. Thanks very much. Bye. On behalf of uh, Joanna from Celsius uh, Clip Studio, PJ, thank you so much, and thank you to the audience for tuning in today. Thank you. Take care and have a great day. Thanks.